Well, afternoon, everyone. Um, we can blame Maraid for this. She gave me four topics, and I could probably give the half a day, if not the day, talking on the topic. So, as usual, I squeeze too much in, and uh, it's text heavy. So, we, we'll start running through. Um, aggregate standards. Every aggregate type has its own standard. The main ones that we would here be uh, concerned about 12620 aggregates for concrete, um, aggregates for mortar, and then our aggregates for unbound and hydraulic bound material for use in civil and engineering works and road construction. So let's say there's aggregates for bitumen and aggregates for railway ballast as well, but the main ones there. Uh, so they're the main standards, and sta European standards are non regulatory and informal, but they can't be prescriptive. So we have to move on to uh, the standard recommendation. So Ireland's national annexes are, you know, they're standard recommendations. So the SRs they're referred to. So they're equivalent of a national standard. So um, we have SR 16, guidance on the use of aggregates for concrete, SR 18, guidance on the use of aggregates for mortar, and SR 21, guidance on the use of dune bone materials. Um, there's also um, IS 888, which is a code of practice for procurement and use of unbound granular till hardcore materials uh, for use underneath concrete floors. Again, like that's a document that every site should have. That document tells you how to use the Annex ES or 21 material. Um, IS 398 is for the reinstatement works only. We have engineers specifying that they want to fill under new bills. It should comply with the reinstatement standard. Which causes a lot of grief, especially if somebody's unspotted and they use the, the current one that complies with the regulation. So 398 should only be used for reinstatement. Um, again, a cessation of conformity, the AOC systems. In Ireland, we've gone for system two plus. So it's third party certified by a notified body. So we certification. So all these standards are gone two plus. So it's certification by an outside notified body. And who is a notified body? You know, uh, the, they're the certifier or the auditor. So if you work into two plus and you put a product on the market, you have your DOP, you have your CMI, but you have your cert compliance with the standards as well. So the production conformity bodies, if uh, PCs, certification bodies, infection bodies, laboratory bodies. So those bodies are approved by the respective member state, first of all, and then notified to EU and the other member states. The main one in Ireland would be NSAI or SGS is another one. There's probably three or four notified bodies working in Ireland. Uh, their role then for two plus, that's for the manufacturer. You have your factory production control for the testing of the samples, initial type testing, um, notified body, it's, it's role there. So surveillance certification, surveillance, um, and audit of, of the samples will be section one, one plus. One plus is generally for cement, but the only one I know of in the industry that one plus where the auditor comes and takes a sample, brings away and gets it tested. Where two plus, they rely on, on the testing that's carried out by the producer. Um, what's audited? Uh, a lot of text there, but the, each standard will have an annex on the back and the annex gives a list of properties that are tested for. So, and then you have your guidance on the uh, petrographical assessment of the aggregates is also carried out. So your grading, your magnesium sulfur soundness, your water absorbency, your sulfate, your sulfurs, um, durability, alkali silica, chloride, they're all listed down. And you're, they're given what we call um, national, uh, national parameters. So a lot of these would have national parameters set, the minimum standard that these have to comply with is in, in the back of the standard. So as a producer, we have the standard, we go to the National Annex, we look at what's required, and we have to carry all that, all that testing out and have it ready to present for audit. And on top of that, Maraid and her team, through uh, the surveillance of, of the, the industry, Maraid can send her team out to do market surveillance. And they arrive in, and they have to see all this information again and has to be available for Maraid and her team when they visit the location. And it's unannounced, they just arrive. Very mean. <laughs> She's not listening to me. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so anyway, this is the, you know, the one that everyone concerned about is their acid soluble and their total sulfur, sulfur and your petrographic assessment. So your acid soluble sulfate uh, fragments or concrete is 0.2 and your total sulfur is 1%. So every property has its limit set to national time parameters. Um, geographically and petrographic assessment, again, that's a, a, a typical one I copied out from one of our quarries at Sandpit down classes. So classes, you know, it's a glacial flow, sand, uh, gravel source and the, Nov the, the Novian sandstone formations. So it gives a description of what the material is and then statement of compliance Aggregates produce a class of quarry, comply with the standards, and then you get your aggregates to comply with the, the various standards. So you have SR21, SR16, SR17, SR18. So the geologists will come into the quarry, look at the quarry, look at the sand pit, do his assessment, take his samples away, do his chemical analysis on it, and he'll give this declaration of compliance then that the quarry is as per. And that's some, some of these testing has to be done three, four times a year. And chemical analysis depending on volumes going out of the quarry and again this is all has to be produced annually for audit and then be available if we get market surveillance in factory production control we've gone away from a manual this tick in roadstone and we've converted our factory production controls to a flow chart and these are up on the wall in the factories and then when the auditor comes in he can just go through the flow chart Again, a lot of text here, the text heavy, you can't see it. So I just blew up a couple of sections, top right hand corner. So materials, all our testing 12620, supplier, dockets there, all have to be retained. And then you go through the flow chart, um, your ag stockpiles, your feed hoppers, your storage bins, your cement silos, your water. All this has to be labeled, documented in, in the flow chart. And you go down to the flow chart and you pick up what we say we're doing. Do what you say and say what you do. Is, is the key to having an audit. And then you, you move on, curing of the block on the yard, uh, banding, storage, loading, delivery docket, all this traceability end that has to be done. You know, so we have to ban the docket, put a code on the docket, name, date. Uh, we can trace that block then through the ban back to when the block was produced. I think the Concrete Federation or negotiation with, with Mairead and the team to see can we up the ante there a little bit to get better traceability on blocks. But the moment you have your docket as your proof of purchase, the description on the docket should be right, and then the ban number on the ban should be able to, is able to trace that block to the day it was produced. Again, all the documents involved in the audit, you know, your, your, your associated procedures and then the documents. It's all on the flow chart and all these documents are on file ready for audit. And this goes for stone, for our blacktop, for block production, concrete production, EN206. We have a flow chart and we expect an FBC annual audit from our, the, the notified body and then follow up audit then from, from uh, our team. And at, when the audit is successful, you get your certificate of conformity with the standard. And again, system two plus, you see it there in the top right hand corner, system two plus. The odd, the, the NSCI's reference code in Europe is 0050. So NSCI is a registered notified body. And they're also audited for INAB, Irish National Accreditation Board, NSCI are audited to be compliant with that. And they give their search compliance. So you have it there for, that's 12620. That's the typical one for your mortar, 13139. And there's the blocks. And there's one, probably one missing there, the Annex ESR21, I didn't copy it in. But certification for each product. Um, what's in, you know, 12620? Aggregate size, grading, shape, all the bits and pieces down there, density, physical properties, chemical properties, valuation conformity. So that's what's in the standard. That's the index of the standard. We, as a company and as an industry, have to have the standard. We have to go through it. And we have to do all this testing and know all about our product. And we fill out our forms and get it all on the declaration of performance as we go ready for audit. And the annex is involved in the standard. We're not pulling stuff out of air. We're pulling stuff out of control document, construction products regulations, send standard, CE mark and adopt at the end of certification. 
um, just close up on, on section four, we'll say one of them, you know, geometric requirements, general ag size grading, shape and aggregates, shell content, fines quantity, fines quality. So fines content and fines quality, again, it all has to be certified, all has to be figured out, all has to be declared, put on our DOP and have the backup testing ready for audit. Um, SR16, our national fine parameters. This is where, you know, this is where the values are put on it. The standard tells you what you have to do. The national the annex DSRs gives you the values. So some of the values there we're looking at um, flakiness, your uh, fines content. So F16 for crushed rock, F4 for crushed rock there, natural ag fine aggregate have a F3. So fines content, fines quality. Uh, water absorption value, magnesium sulfate value, dry and shrinkage value. So there's all values, national fine parameters are put on the aggregate then. And these are minimum standards that has to meet the stone. If you're out on one of these, you can shut your quarry. It won't meet aggregates for concrete. You could have a quarry just producing cheap fill, but you can't get certified for aggregates for concrete rags which are fill. And there again, your, your total sulfur 1 to 6 to 0 levels, your AS 0.2, and your total sulfur uh, less than or equal to 1%. So, as I say, national fine parameters. They're in the building regulations that come up in, say, structure part A. Minimum strength of a block is 7.5 newtons, minimum strength for a cavity block is 4.5 newtons. The moisture movement for a concrete block is in Euro code 6, 1996 part one. The mortar you use in the national annex of 1996 part one. So they're not, they're defined provisions that are in the national annex. That SR18 guidance on the use of aggregates for mortar. Again, all your provisions are listed there in the standard, what you have to comply with. That the testing you have to do and, and the properties of that sand have to be complied with um what's not in the mortar standard and i'm going to start talking a little bit about the topic now what might not be down here for, for durability and keeping the water out because the the standards can't be prescriptive you, you you don't have a grading so our annex doesn't really have a grading in it so i went back out to the bs standard here so there's a typical grading for sands for external rendering um and an internal rendering. So there's two types of sand, a type A and a type B. And I'll come to the, when we come up with the mix, we'll go through this a bit more. But these days, that's a, not a 600, it's a 500 micron sieve. But the difference between these two sands is one is fine and one is coarse. So you can have 55% passing the 600 micron in your type B, where you can. 15 to 18% in your type A. So there's a distinct difference here between the two standards. Um, one is finer and one is coarser based on the amount of pass in your 600. The same with your sands for, um, well, that's the plastering one, this is the, the block one. Your mortar sand is here. So there's a difference in the, the fineness of the mater two materials. And when we come to the um, prescribed recipes, for our mortars and our renders, we we'll pick up on these two, you know, your type A and your type B and your type S and your type G. One is coarse, one is fine. Who here goes in on a site inspection and the guys are site batching the sand and you look at the sand, pick up that sand. Who knows whether it's coarse, who knows whether it's fine? I have an instance recently of a job um, and the guy bought all the blocks off us and he bought two loads of plaster and sand. One load to build the house and the other load to plaster the house. So that's the sharp, coarse plastering sand, the sharp sand. If the, the guy batching that sand used five to one rather than six to one, he got a very strong mortar. And the mortar, rule of thumb, the mortar is weaker than the block. And what did I go down to his house to look at when he was built? Only he had no movement joints in it and lo and behold, he got cracks. And when I looked at what was delivered to him, he used plaster and sand for his mortar sand. Which to me tells me he probably used the plaster and sand, which is much stronger sand than, than mortar sand, and the block, the mortar was stronger than the block, and the blocks cracked. You know, 
these are old rule of thumbs that's out there that, that the old guys in their 60s and 70s know about. The new guy put on a shovel here, make a bit of mortar, doesn't know any of this stuff anymore. That's why training is so important. You know, the, the, this is all written down in standards and has been written down in standards since clickety click. The building regulations are there since 92. You swear the stuff we're putting out now and telling people about that we, we're just after inventing it. Pre-92, uh, IS325 referred you out to BS5628, the British standard. And all these things were in the British standard. And that goes back to the 80s and 70s. You know, from the first publication of IS325, we hadn't a part two. We only had a part two since 95 in IS325. But prior to that, IS325 kicked you out to BS5628 for the wind driven rain map and the mortar proportions and all of this. It's all been there for years. Unfortunately, it's been forgotten. And with the race to build, get them up, get them up fast, get them up now. We forgot all this stuff. Um, right, so here we have the, uh, the, the mixes, prescribed mixes for mortar. And here, as I said, we have our option, an M4 mortar, one to five to six. One, one, five to six, or we just go straight uh, cement uh, and thing one to five to six. And that's your old designation, three mortar, but now it's called an M4. M for mortar and four for the strength. But here we say when the sand proportion is given, for example, five to six, the lower value should be used with sands containing a higher proportion of fines, whilst the higher figure should be used with sands containing a lower proportion of fines. So if your sand is gritty and sharp, move your proportion out to six. If your sand is fine and very fine, you bring your proportion down to five. But again, this old information, I feel, has been forgotten. And if a block clear goes in and he wants to build quick, he'll go four to one, so the mortar set so he can go up with more than his seven courses in the afternoon. And then you have stronger mortar than the block, you'll end up with cracking, differential and shrinkage across the blockwork wall, and bang. And of course, who did they call then? Ghostbusters. You called the block manufacturer because the block cracked. Same thing for the render. Again, you get your option, your coarse or your sharp sand. Three to four, five to six, seven to eight. And again, with fine or poorly graded sands, a lower volume sand should cement sand should be used. So if you have a fine plastering sand, you use a higher cement content. You get an old dry powdery render on the wall because the sand was wrong and you're out rubbing it and it's powdering off in your hand because it was too fine and the guy didn't get his cement proportion right. You can't keep the water out if the render is porous and poorly graded. Um, SR21 guidance on the use of 13242. Again, Annex E is the main one for house building. There are other annexes part of it for your drainage material or any of your materials there, your other fill materials, your 6Fs, it's all different parts, but your Annex E is your fill for underneath concrete floors and footpaths. We are still getting specifications in with Clause 804 on the spec. And up nearly every year we get somebody who put in 804 or didn't put in the right material can you recertify give us a docket saying it was annex e sr21 sorry we can't you bought what you bought you got delivered what you bought you put it in you used it now you have your floor and insulation on top of it and the engineers condemning it and all sorts of backtracking and retesting and the whole lot and we've had some engineers even though when they tested it it was okay they still made them take it out but we, we can only do so much. So there you go. So again, the, the, the physical properties are set in the standard and we have to make the material to those properties and have them tested. And it's all about your water absorption, your properties that, that define the durability of the material that keeps the thing dry and keeps it right are all in the standards. And your geological classification is there and your sulfur contents are there as well. 
So the durability of the stone is all there, magnesium surface, your water absorbency, your chloride content, they're all in the standard and, and there's limits put on them for all the different stone types that I went through in the start. So, Alexey, you have your TO structural. If your cut is too deep and you have to dig out a lot of bad ground and your footings are high, you go with your, your, your TO structural first of all. Depth's greater than 900 mil. There's no point in filling up a big deep hole with your typical Annex E grading, which are 40 mil down fine material. You build it up in your structural material first, and then you convert to your T1 structural, your 0 to 31.5 first drop, <coughs> or your 0 to 40 first gravel. The radon, we talked about radon here today. Gas won't flow through this. 804 type braidings compacted, which are 30 mil to fines content to, you know, up to six, seven, 12 percent fines compacted. You have a density there of 2,400, the same concrete if they're compacted. Gases won't pass through them freely. So you need your permeable layer. And people say that your parent, oh, we can't compact it, we can't do this, we can't do that. If you had a copy of IS888 on site and you went to the back of it, it would give you your roller size and your compactor size, how to place it and how to compact it. And once you say here, there's my roller size, there's my vibrator size, I've compacted it to that. The engineer, I followed what's in the standard, it's compacted. And the guy's walking in on it and doing that heel test. That's not compacted at all. You know, but you have to follow what's in IS888. Um, so there you go. That's your Annex E. So um, Richard mentioned this. Unique identifying number and description. It's in the standard. So every product now on the DOP has a unique identifying code and a description on the docket. So what you get on the docket, your, your, your code and your description links the thing back to what's on the dock. So what's on the docket should be on the dock. Your unique, unique identifying number for a block, for your seven and a half, your 13s, for your concrete, they all have a code that's unique to that and a unique description. So you won't get half a load, that's out in the standard. You won't get half a load of type three and half a load of type one on the one truck. They're individual truckloads and they're individual products with individual identifying codes and they're identified on the dock and identified on the dock as prescribed in the annex. And again, the properties of the material are declared in the standard and therefore has to be declared on the dock. For blocks. This document was published back in April of 22. After Maraid and the team went out doing her surveillance audits and checking up on everyone, they found that the DOPs were in a little bit of a mess around the country. So the department got together and published this document, free to download off the internet. And if you're buying blocks, you should have a copy of this and have it read and understand it. What's expected of everyone? There's a very nice diagram in the middle of it that I love because it gives my obligations. So I make the dock block and I stick the declaration performance on it and the dock and the CE mark on it and I sell the block. So I'm responsible for that. When the block gets to site, workmanship, standards, compliance with the building regulations. Materials fit for purpose and use. Do I need a seven and a half? Do I need a 13? Do I need an 18? What block do I want? Is it fit for use? And proper installation. Building control. You guys are supposed to keep an eye on it. But the people responsible are the owner, the builder, the specified designer, and the certifier. All of this here. That's your baby. And I get asked, as a major supplier, I get phoned up and I'm asked to do these. And it's not my job. I don't, cert I don't visit the sites, I don't supervise the build, I don't design the build, I don't finish the build and I don't maintain the build. 
we supply the blocks, the blocks are to be used properly. And it's set down in the guidance document now from the government. They also put this in, which if I go back there, you see this little bit here, take into consideration national provisions. That dotted line comes back and back to me as the producer. But well, we have to take into consideration national provisions. So on the DOP, a year or so ago, we just had basic information. So the guidance now came out with this, and they want us to link all the properties of the block back to the national provisions. And the national provisions are spread out everywhere. They're in the technical guidance documents, they're in the building regulations, they're in annexes to the structural design code, they're in SR325. But they wanted us to link national provisions to the DOP. So that when someone picks up the DOP, they can read it and understand, you know, they have more information they had. We used to just have durability, not to be left exposed, because that's what's in the standard. But these guidelines says, no lads, go further, go more, give more out there because people don't know what IS325 is. So give more information. So we did. Um, there you go. So, you know, they're linking it out to SR325, SR325. Annex E, that as a piece of wide guidance document and structure. So, this is all our B fire, you know, um, water vapor permeability. So, all the properties are linked now to the national provision switch. Then, meet me up. Instead of having a single pager, she ended up in four pages. And the C mark has to be a separate document. It can be shared in one PDF file, but now you have to have a separate CMARC document. And that's European law. We were cheating before and just putting the CMARC on the DOP, but now we have to have a separate document. And again, the properties of the block are all laid down in national revision, but this is the change since 22, right? As an example there, moisture movement. In the back of Eurocode, you have the moisture movement less than 0.6 of a millimeter per meter. So now on my DOP, I am saying movement joints at seven meter centers and where it comes from. I've had engineers when you go to a job and there's cracks in it and there's no movement joints. Ah, you don't need movement joints in domestic. You only need them if you're building a school or working for the council. Seriously, I've had that said to me that I was interpreting the standards wrong. But now it's on my DOP. And if they're not used and you get cracks, I produce the DOP. Material fit for purpose. Go back through it. You know. So more is less or whatever, but more is more here. There's more information now on the DOP. And the guidelines asked us to do this, to put more on there. Um, I mean, another example water absorbency, no vapor from erection to fire. Fraction to fire nor organic semi material, that's okay. But we go on here to, oh, bugger. The pages are coming in the background. That's a pity. Um, because I had the durability pages on. Um, so, as regards durability, we now have on, the pre on our DOP, I've gone through the durability. So, I've gone into table 14 of SR325. And I've pulled off what a seven and a half Newton block can do. And I've pulled off what a 13 Newton block can do. And I've put the render requirement as a national provision. And I've put the exposure classes from the Euro code on the national provision. And I put the exposure classes from SR325 on the national provision. And I've put that the blocks are made with aggregates compliant 12620. So the durability now nearly takes over one whole page, stating things that we, we, we could already no. Um, if you go to the presentation, just as, no, yeah, leave it. We'll, we'll cover it again. I can, I can send it on. You're just yeah, probably going to circulate the presentations anyway. Um, so we move on to renders and plasters. And we go to our technical guidance. And there's overlap. The guys have mentioned this already. I'm going to drive it home. External walls, in addition to meeting requirements of part that, Resist penetration, rain or snow to the inside of the building. 
not be damaged by rain or snow and not carry rain or snow to any part of the building that could be damaged by it. The block is part of the building. If the water gets through the render, it gets to the block. The block is a structural element as part of the building. Water shouldn't be getting into the block to be damaging it. It's only seven and a half Newtons. If I went to EN 206 and somebody said, build me a mass concrete house, the minimum concrete strength I would use to comply with EN 206 would be a 37 Newton concrete with 310 kgs of cement in it. A block is only seven and a half Newtons. It's not designed to be durable without the render. It's part of a wall system. It is not the wall. There are 14 parts to design a wall in SR325. Durability and all the things design, wind loading, and all the things there. Materials is number three, and it doesn't list the materials. But if we do list the materials, wall ties, DPCs, mortar, cavity trays, all the parts that make up the wall. The block is only one part of the materials, and it's only one part of the whole design of the wall. And there's 13 or 14 parts to wall design in SR325. Part D, the construction should prevent the passage of moisture to the material, or the material should be treated or otherwise protected from moisture. You know, C and D are clear to me what the wall should be protected. And they're around since 92. So our exposure classes for our render. Moderate sheltered exposure recommended render and specification. So Table F3 of 325 gives you your, your, your um, mother and shelter exposure. What render you need? Two code system. It gives you your thickness, 8 to 12 mil, 7 to 10 mil, and gives you your classification of the mix and what it should be, and gives you your, your background. All that information is there for your render. And rendering it is very poor out there. For your severe exposure class, first undercoat, second undercoat, final coat, one, two, three, three coat render system. How many places around the country are using three coats? Your scud coat is not a coat unless it's three mil thick and covering the full surface of the wall. Can't be counted. So severe exposure it's a tree coat system with a rough cast finish. Again, this has been in the regulations back since clickety click BS5628 and not enforced and not used. So, again, 15 mil, 20 mil, two coats, three coats. Moderate, severe. And here's your wind. We've seen this map over and over and over again today. So your sheltered mother sphere, high buildings, high buildings. If you're in a sheltered area and you form a wind tunnel because you have houses on top and high buildings and low buildings, you actually form a wind tunnel. You can change the classification to severe. If you're eight kilometers from the coast or on a hill, you can change your classification on the map to severe. Just because you're in moderate doesn't mean that you're not in severe. If the conditions of the site are different, you're up on a hill or you're beside the coast and it's eight kilometers from a major estuary. And the Shannon estuary goes nearly into Tipperary. You know, so the, these things are there, they've been in the standards. Everything dark green is severe. And building regulations have been saying since 90, since I said BS5628, that everything green needs three coat surrender. Is it being used? We're using one coat renders. The new map is going up to extreme. Now it's a different classification, but with global warming and climate change and all the rest of it, I think the conditions have also changed. But that's the new map that, that we're working to. So, according to Met Aaron, 
We have an average of eight storms a year. 2024, we got up to 11. And your average is greater than 80 kilometers an hour. Winter storms. Uh, the climate's getting milder. It might be getting milder, but we're getting 11 winter storms with 80 kilometer an hour winds every year. And rain farm events, rain farm, rain events to go with it. Movement joints, 2018, seven meters. External walls contain an opening. In recent project, we got caught on this, but I didn't get caught on it. Um, the three to one ratio. Architect came along with lovely deep windows. First floor, floor to seal and window in the bedrooms. And that meant the panel size from the head of his ground floor to his sill on the first floor was only 11 bricks. And he had his movement joints in at six meter centers. With that panel of bricks, you needed a joint in the middle of it. And where did it crack? In the middle of it. You know? So like, the rules are there. They're written in about panel size and where you need the movement joints. Um, wall containing openings, movement joints may be needed for right, more frequent intervals. Again, you're lucky to see a movement joint between the terraces or between the semi Ds and that's all. They're seen, they're ugly. We can't have them. They can be hidden now. There's all sorts of proprietary colored beads available. Very, very neat systems that you can just tack on and the movement joint can be hidden. No one sees them. They should be part of the build. They should be there. They should be used. Ghosting or shadowing. When we went through the proper sands, the gritty sand and the dry powdery mix and the, the fine sand and the plaster. Ghosting or shadowing. Well over half of the nap plaster houses around the country, lads, if you go look at the side of them or look at them when they're built, you can see ghosting of the mortar through it. If you can see the outline of the block on a house that built a year, and you can look at that grey nap plaster or that colour render, and you can see the shadowing of the block inside that, what is happening that you can see the mortar? The water is getting in. The render is not keeping the out. So ghosting and shadowing, and there's your definition of it. Seeing the outline or underlying bricks or block through coating of render will almost certainly the result of poorly applied render. The render will likely not be sufficiently thick or one of the stages of the application may have been missed or badly done. And there you go. And there you go. Like, blocks are there, blocks are there. You know, definitely see the shadowing of the blocks. Look at newly built houses, look at the gables. You can see this. It tells me the rendering is not good enough and the water is getting through the render. Honestly, like show of hands here, who's seen this in the last six months? You've all seen it. <laughs> Agramont, Agramont's been mentioned a few times today. Agrimont certification design specific for a new material products and process not yet have a long history of use or which published national standards do not exist. So have you an Agrimont cert? We don't have an Agrimont cert. The effort we made, make is made to a standard and has a long history of use. But these new materials are coming in, they don't have a national standard. So once you have an Agrimont cert, everything is grand, tiki de boo, get it, stick it in a folder, use it. Nobody's reading them and reading what they're saying and reading the good bits. And as I mentioned today, your full fill. If you go to an Agramont cert for full fill and you go to durability, you'll get wordings like any issue that may affect the installation, i.e. quality of the render or cracks in the wall needs to be investigated. Do not use full fill. And that's on the Agramon cert for fulfill for them all. And if you have no movement joints, what have you got? You've got cracks. You mightn't see the cracks. If you've got ghosting and shadowing, 
what have you got? You've got render that's not suitable for full fill. Yet there are hundreds of houses along that green zone along the west of Ireland, full fill cavity. It's suitable if everything's right and everything is done as per the Agramont cert. But if the render is not right, it is not suitable. I also get calls from people. We have your masonry, you have your hallmark, your keltstone. We had the cavity pumped in full. Now your block is leaking. Who installed it? It shouldn't have been installed. You know, the, my block is leaking. My block was always leaking. 16 to 17 percent of a brick wall is mortar joints. The mortar is not mortar, waterproofed and there's movement in it. And that's where the water is blown through the wind driven rain. So, yes, there was always water getting through. But you had a 40 mil residual cavity there taking the water back out. Now they filled the cavity. You can't take the stuff back out. Well, you can, but it's a disaster. So you're telling here, go get a sealer, seal your wall and hope for the best. But it's not my problem. My block complies with the regulation. Go back to the Agramon, go back to the Agramon people, go back to the installer, ask them why they installed full fill insulation where they shouldn't have filled it, put it in. Another one that we have is the one called render systems. I, they're not covered by a national standard. But I looked at one recently as 40 year design life with maintenance on a one coat render system. Design life of a house, I think, is 70 years. But the one coat render system had 40 years with maintenance on the Agramont cert. Is that been handed over with your handover file to the buyer? Keep an eye on your render there. You might have to paint it and fill the cracks and keep the water out. You know, so Agramont is Agramont. There's no history of use, but just because you have an agreement on certain you get it and you stick it in the folder doesn't mean everything's going to be okay. Read the agreement on cert, understand it. Typical specification. Again, this only came in last week. We have a block standard, EN 771 part 3. All the test methods are listed to 7772, full list of test methods. We have our moisture movement figure stated and listed in the Eurocode design code. But here we have a very big, reputable engineering firm. They want the drying shrinkage tested to the American standard. You can use a British standard or an Irish standard. British standard for blocks is level four, self-certified, seven Newton strength. Not seven and a half and not third party certified with system two plus. And they don't have the same provisions in for protection of the aggregates as we now have in the Irish standard. And then you come down here and we're doing all the sulfate testing on the aggregates going into the block and calculating all the sulfates. And prior to the contract can confirm their masonry prior, all the materials are free from deleterious materials and representative blocks have been tested for pyrite. There is no requirement in the Irish building regulations to test a block because it is assumed that the block, the aggregates comply with 12620, they've been tested to death. You make a block, the aggregates don't change. So like, why bother as a company doing all our testing and getting certification the whole lot when this type of specification comes in? It's, it's disheartening for someone like me. There's, there's a lot of work involved, that's, you know, 13 and a half Newton. 13 Newton strength, ASTM standard, British standard, and pyrite. Anyway, just a matter. Roadstone, that's our, our map. There's all the dots. You know, 41 quarries, 11 sand pits, 16 asphalt, 20 blocks, roof tile, powdered limes, chemical paving, shops. And just, that's over 250 product certification audits annually. When you add all that up. That's the level of audit we are subjected to, 250 product audits a year. And each one of those locations have the overarching ISO 9001 accreditation as well. And on top of that, we're subject to market surveillance. 
So it's highly regulated now. And has been since BCAR in 2014. And it was regulated before and the, the, the rules were there. It's an awful pity the rules weren't employed on site as they should have been. Because as I say, 92 building regulations came in. IS325 70s referred out to 5628. And you can track all this wind driven rain map and requirements of renderers and good sands and the gradings and the mixed proportions, a whole lot, all the way back. Rollstone Learn platform, there's 11 full CPD presentations on all of these topics on the Rollstone Learn. You get the CPD points out. It's worthwhile knowing they're there and directing people to it to look at, especially guys starting out. We have 11 CPDs up on the Rose and Learn platform for the industry, free of charge to the industry to use. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi.